By now, we're all very familiar with the coronavirus pandemic, more familiar than we ever hoped to be. But did you know that there is another pandemic? Not one that spikes in a matter of weeks or months, but one that is slow growing. It's a slow motion pandemic. It's one that's caused by our routines and our choices and the food we eat. You will see it in your lifetime. I have. I remember as a medical student, a girl came in with an ear infection. And after talking to the attending supervising me, I learned that there were no antibiotics that could work for this particular type of bacteria because the bacteria was resistant. It had mutated and no antibiotics could work. It was a hopeless feeling to tell the mom that there was nothing modern medicine could offer and the child would have to suffer through the infection running its course for a week or two. Well, that was a rare event, and now that's becoming more common. Even today, as a surgeon, we'll do routine surgery on someone who's otherwise healthy, and then afterwards, sometimes an infection will set in caused by a resistant bacteria. One of those common resistant bacteria that we see in the hospital setting is called C. diff, or Clostridium difficile. We call it C. diff. About a third of severe cases of this C. diff infection are resistant to every antibiotic available. Sometimes the body can't fight the infection. We actually do an operation to remove the infected organ just because no antibiotics are available. We're seeing this more and more. As a matter of fact, the reason for it is that the rate of mutation is now accelerating faster than our ability to create new antibiotics. You can see in this graph the number of new antibiotics FDA approved every year used to be four or five a year. Now it's one to two antibiotics a year. But the rate of mutation in the bacteria is growing exponentially. Some experts say by 2050, in our lifetime, we could see up to 10 million people die a year from resistant bacteria at this current rate of growth. Imagine the coronavirus map. This is the map that my Johns Hopkins colleagues created to track coronavirus. Imagine this tracking resistant bacteria, infections from resistant bacteria, and deaths from resistant bacteria. This is the slow-moving pandemic, but it's not a fate we have to accept. It's one we can act on but we've got to do it quick. The rate of mutating is getting faster. Bacteria in the first 25 years that they were studied took on average 21 years to mutate around antibiotics. In the subsequent 25 years, they took about 13 years. And in the last 25 years, it's taken about one year for antibiotics to mutate and become resistant to known antibiotics. You know, bacteria are not as attractive artistically as viruses. They don't get the same media attention. They don't necessarily spike in a short period of time. And bacteria mutate quickly. They can mutate around a vaccine, unlike viruses, which tend to be more stable. And a vaccine can be effective for an entire season or sometimes longer. Bacteria are different. Today, about one-third of all bacteria that cause human illness has resistance to at least one antibiotic, and some multiple. We're seeing more and more the consequences in the hospital, among patients that come to us. About two million people a year come to their doctor because of bacteria with resistance to antibiotics, and about 23,000 to 35,000 people a year right now die from resistant bacteria, resistant to antibiotics. About a third of the countries that report to the World Health Organization report widespread antimicrobial resistance. That's today. It's so bad that the World Health Organization has issued a statement saying that antimicrobial resistance is a global crisis that threatens a century of progress in health. That century of progress began in 1928 when Dr. Alexander Fleming noticed after coming back 
from vacation for two weeks when his laboratory was closed that one of the auger gels that was growing a bacteria called Staphylococcus was covered with a mold that grew over the auger. The mold may have come in through the window. It may have come in from a lab on another floor of that London building. There was another lab working with molds. But he noticed it killed all the bacteria. They repeated the experiments, him and his team, and they noticed it was only one type of mold that killed the bacteria that effectively, a mold called penicillin. Within 10 years, two scientists would help convert this penicillin into a therapeutic, and quickly it saved thousands, ultimately millions of lives. You see, up until that point in human history, many people died from bacteria. People died from infections all the time. People didn't die as commonly from cancer or heart disease. They just didn't live that long. Many were injured or they acquired an infection from somebody else. One of the leading causes of death among women in the world was infection after childbirth and still is in some remote parts of Africa. This was a major advancement, maybe one of the greatest scientific advancements in the history of modern medicine. Ultimately, thousands of soldiers in World War II would have their lives saved by penicillin. Mass production began. And in 1945, Dr. Fleming and his two colleagues accepted the Nobel Prize. But when he accepted that prize in his speech, Fleming warned of the problem of antibiotic overuse. He was right. Doctors began to prescribe antibiotics liberally, and the consumerist culture demanded it, almost with a disregard or a lack of understanding about the long-term problem of resistance that was accruing, antibiotics became commonplace. Now, look, I've seen, as a doctor, antibiotics save lives. I've seen medications save lives. But now we are prescribing 154 million antibiotics a year. That's one antibiotic prescription for every two people in the United States. How many of you have taken an antibiotic in the last couple years? We have a culture of taking a medication in a reactive fashion when many times it's not the right solution. Our healthcare system has become a reactionary healthcare system, sometimes ignoring the underlying causes of the problem and instead simply reacting. But we need a proactive healthcare system, not a reactionary healthcare system. Sometimes we want a pill for everything. I had one patient actually tell me that he wanted an antibiotic even though he knew it was not going to work. In 1997, we prescribed as a medical community in the United States 2.4 billion prescriptions. Last year, it was around 5 billion. Did disease really double over that time? No, we have a crisis of appropriateness. It's time for us to address this and actually listen to the voice of doctors, which we surveyed in a national study we conducted at Johns Hopkins asking 2,100 doctors around the country, in your opinion, what percent of all medications we prescribe are unnecessary? They said 22%. When people on the front lines of any industry are speaking up like that, we need to listen. The CDC says about 30% of all the antibiotics prescribed are completely unnecessary. It's time we start talking about other therapies when medications are not the right therapy. Can we start talking about cooking classes for patients with diabetes and the quality of one's sleep in preventing high blood pressure? Can we start talking about using ice and physical therapy instead of opioids and surgery for back pain? Can we talk about food as medicine and foods that are pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory in addressing the inflammatory state? Can we talk about the effects of antibiotics? Can we talk about these issues in a way that's honest? Look, the opioid crisis was a crisis around one medication. There are many other medications that have been overprescribed. I've overprescribed opioids myself most of my career. 
I, I can't believe, I look back and think about the number of times I gave an opioid prescription to a patient that really did not need it, or prescribed too many opioids for the surgery that I performed. I feel terrible. With good intentions and bad science, I overprescribed. And we've got to start addressing many of these problems with some degree of humility and start talking about a proactive and not a reactive healthcare system. It's important with antibiotics because antibiotics are like putting TNT in the microbiome. The microbiome is a beautiful equilibrium of over 100 million different types of bacteria that normally live in the GI tract. They perform a lot of functions. They're involved in digestion. They produce important molecules like vitamins in some cases. They even produce serotonin, which is involved in mood. The more we learn about the microbiome, the more we're learning about the connection between the microbiome and health. The more we're learning about some of the unintended consequences of things that we used to prescribe liberally, like tetracycline for acne. Those antibiotics are like TNT in the microbiome. And after the explosion of the antibiotic ripping through the microbiome, guess what happens? That void is overpopulated with an overgrowth of other types of bacteria. We now talk about overgrowth syndromes. We now know that some inflammatory conditions are associated with it. The more we learn about the microbiome, the more we learn about its connection to health. Some people tell me that they take antibiotics because they're totally safe. Well, not true. A study from Johns Hopkins by some of my colleagues found that one in five antibiotics delivered in the hospital actually have an adverse side effect, like worsening renal function. This is important because 50% of patients in the hospital get an antibiotic today. We need to think about the judicious use of antibiotics. In fact, my colleagues who authored the paper concluded that these findings magnify the importance of the judicious use of antibiotics. This is good, sound medicine. This is a proactive, sound medical system. Well, if over prescribing is one of the drivers of antimicrobial resistance and something that we can act on. These are entirely actionable causes of this pandemic. The other is where most antibiotics are used, and you may not know this, but 70 to 80% of all antibiotics are not used in humans, they're used in farming. Antibiotics in livestock is a major driver of antibiotic resistance. Up to 20% of all the infections that we see in humans where resistance is a part of the bacteria, that organism originated from the problem of overuse of antibiotics in livestock. 70 to 80% of all the antibiotics produced are used in animals. Why? For no good reason. It's so the animals can be crowded and used in factory farming techniques and sometimes cruel conditions. Is this where you want to get your meat from? Is this the type of farming you want to support with your dollars that are used to purchase things at restaurants and grocery stores? We can do better. We can do better. Here's what we need to do. Number one, we need to think twice about taking antibiotics when there's no good clinical indication. Stop demanding of your doctors that they give you an antibiotic when they recommend against it. Make sure you're on the right antibiotic. Just because z pack is easy to say doesn't mean it's the right antibiotic for you. And we as doctors could do more to prevent transmission of resistant bacteria within the hospital setting. Educating each other on things like hand washing because Sanitizing gels do not prevent the transmission of some types of infection like C. diff, which is rampant in some hospital settings now. We can ask everybody to do more. For those of you interested in the problem of the high price 
of drugs in the United States. If you're concerned about our high drug spend in the United States, let me tell you, the number one way to lower our drug spend overnight is to stop taking drugs we don't need. Think about your purchasing decisions. Think about the next time you go to a restaurant. Ask about sourcing. When you go to the grocery store, ask where the salmon comes from. Is it from a fish farm where antibiotics are routinely used and sometimes other pollutants and heavy metal accumulates, or does it come from fresh waters? Ask where the hamburger comes from. Does it come from a farm where the cattle are not routinely given antibiotics and raised in a humane fashion, or does it come from a factory farm where the animals are routinely given antibiotics? Look, if a cow is sick, the cow may need an antibiotic, but to give antibiotics to every cow is not smart, it's not wise, it's not financially prudent, and it breeds the resistance that we're seeing. These are decisions that we can make every time we make a purchase. It'll create some societal pressure. It'll create demand in the marketplace. Already we've seen some companies respond to that demand for healthier food. As a matter of fact, the public interest group PIRG has created a scorecard on how some companies are doing in the sourcing of their food, looking at things like the routine use of antibiotics. It turns out that some companies like McDonald's, KFC, Subway have made commitments to try to improve significantly on their sourcing and to stop the routine use of antibiotics. We can help drive this change and reduce antimicrobial resistance. When Bill Gates gave his TED talk talking about the risk of a future viral pandemic, many people know he was talking about a virus, but do you know he was also talking about microbes or bacteria, it is still very much a risk. And not only is it a risk, the pandemic has already set in. This is our opportunity to take steps through our everyday routines, decisions, and the food we eat to try to address this global pandemic. So if I were to ask you, if there was something you could have done before the coronavirus pandemic, to help stop that pandemic, would you have done it? Here's something where we can do something. So the next time you go to purchase food or go to the grocery store, the next time you go to a physician's office with a minor viral infection or ask about the option of antibiotics, please keep in mind what you can do to help stop and fight the next global pandemic. Thank you.